Good morning and welcome to the Sunday School class of the Franklin Church of Christ. We appreciate so much you watching us on Facebook Live and attending this session today. We're going to look at the book of 1 Peter. We are um, doing a series called Finding Your Way in a Whatever World. Today's lesson is a reason to deepen and we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1 beginning in verse 13 and go through chapter 2 verse 3. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and be turning there and, and follow along today as we do our Bible study. You know, the birth of a newborn baby is almost always a time of rejoicing. It's exciting times, but that joy presupposes the normal growth of the child. If I were to show you a picture in five years and he's still seven and a half pounds, not talking, not eating, not walking, there would be sympathy and not joy. And so if that baby doesn't mature, if he doesn't grow to maturity, there's something seriously wrong, and we're extremely disappointed. Now, the same principle applies to us spiritually. You know, as we began our study last week of 1 Peter, the, the opening paragraph focused on the fact that we've been born again, and we have a reason to hope in Jesus Christ. In the beginning of verse 13 of 1 Peter chapter 1, it begins with a word that says, therefore. It's almost like a legal term. It's a transition word. It conveys the idea that since the previous principles are true, here is the action or the attitude that should follow what Peter's been talking about. This section emphasizes our need to grow to maturity and deepen our spiritual roots. I think it's sad when people have been Christians for years, but there's been very little spiritual growth in their lives. Their thinking is just as shallow as it ever was, and their behavior isn't really different than it was when they first began to know their Lord. Their relationships are still pretty surface. The Apostle Paul expressed frustration when he wrote the church at Corinth and when he talked about them having a lack of spiritual development, he wrote, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. That's found in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians verses 1 through 2. And so Paul writes them and shares that with them. So therefore, Peter's doing the same thing. He's encouraging his readers not to be stunted in their development, but to move on into maturity in Christ. And there are really two primary reasons that we need to grow deeper in the Christian life. The first is to have the strength to withstand trouble when it arises. Jesus predicted in the Gospels that some seed will fall on shallow soil. And he compares that to our faith. It'll, it'll come up quickly but since it has no depth, it only lasts for a short time. So when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, that person quickly falls away. So if we don't deepen our faith, we'll be disappointed when church leaders uh, disappoint us or if disease strikes you. Or is it just easy to become bitter and blame God? Or we'll become weak or we'll yield to temptation? But the second reason we need to deepen our faith is to appreciate the best that God has to offer. Jesus said, I've come to you that you might have life to the fullest. And if we're just skimming the surface of the Christian life, just think of all the things that we're missing out. Just think of the abundant life that God wants to give you. So the last phrase of today's section, if you go ahead and look at chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, it says, Grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. I read an interesting story this week uh, uh, about a man whose name is Glenn Hedgepeth. And he said that when he was a young boy that he always ordered a cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke. He was a very picky eater and he ordered cheeseburger, fries, and Coke just every time. So his father took him to this real expensive restaurant. And he says, Glenn... I would like for you to humor me, and here's what I want to do. I, I'm going to order a steak for you, 
And I just want you to take a bite of it. And I want you to taste it. And so he did. He said, now, if you don't like this, I'll, I'll order your cheeseburger fries. and we'll, we'll go to that if you don't. But just, just taste this. So he orders it. So the filet came to the table, and he takes his knife, and he cuts that piece of steak, and he puts it in his mouth, and he chews it. He chews for a moment. Then he lifts up his eyes, and he looks at his dad and said, Dad, why didn't you tell me about this before? Well, <laughs> there's more to the Christian life than what some of you are experiencing. You're satisfied, it seems, with being saved, but salvation is much more than a fire insurance policy to eternity. It isn't just about getting you to heaven. It's about getting heaven into you here while we're here on this earth. It's about looking more like Jesus as the years go by. And so Simon Peter challenges us to taste the meaty truths of God's Word and to see that He is good. So today, I want us to see three different areas where we need to grow deeper in the Christian life. So we are to deepen mentally by preparing our minds for action. Look at verse 13. He says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. It seems to me that our society puts more emphasis on feeling than thinking. Music, art, movies, they're all about feeling. I've heard people say, well, I don't really understand the words. I can't really hear the words, but it makes me feel good. And then you've got to see this movie. Why, it'll scare the tar out of you. And then people are told to follow their heart. Do what you feel is right in your gut. If it feels good, do it. And unfortunately, I believe even church services are evaluate, evaluated more on how it makes you feel than what we want to learn. And you know, God has given us emotions as a distinctively good gift. I mean, you just think about all of our emotions. What a blessing it is that we have them. Excitement, fear, laughter, sadness, anger, romance, joy. All of these are God-given feelings. For the Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes that there is a time to weep and a, and a time to laugh. So we are blessed with that ability to have all kinds of emotion. And some people are more emotional than others. Different temperaments have a greater capacity for feeling than others. But God has given us the capacity to reason, to think. In the book of Isaiah, it says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. We're told repeatedly in Scripture that wisdom, that ability to apply knowledge to everyday life, and discernment, the ability to determine what is right or what is wrong, among the highest virtues that we can have. You know, when Solomon took over the kingdom from his father David, God told him he could have anything he requested. So Solomon prayed, Give me wisdom and knowledge that I might lead your people. And God was so pleased that Solomon didn't ask for wealth or for riches or status or even victory over his enemies. God blessed him with a long life and gave him wisdom among measure. But here Peter says, prepare your mind for action. I like what the King James says. The King James translates the Greek literally here, and it says to gird up the loins of your mind. It pictures a man pulling up his robe and tucking it in so that he can run. He can run fast. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah tucked his cloak into his belt. In other words, he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab. The message paraphrases it. He says, so roll up your sleeves, put your mind in gear. So in other words, get mentally, get mentally alert so that we can take the fast, appropriate action that we need to take. Most of the time when Christians fall into temptation is because they yield to temporary emotions. 
Why did you have that affair when you had a wife and two children at home? It wasn't because you sat down and reasoned through it and thought this is the best thing to do. It's because all of a sudden you go through an extreme emotion and we say, well, the chemistry just flowed and I've fallen in love with this person, this man or this woman. I followed my heart. Well, why did you cuss your boss and lose your job? Well, I got so angry at him for putting me down. I just exploded. I lost control. Well, why did you go so far in debt for that boat or for that car or for that house? Well, we saw it. We got so excited and bought it on impulse. We always wanted one. We just felt like we had to have it. It'll be so much fun. So you see, if we're to su survive the challenges of Christian life, we, we've got to deepen mentally to the point, really, to where we override temporary fluctuating emotions. As we deepen in the Christian life, we move from being emotionally driven to being spiritually driven. And you might expect me to say rationally driven, driven by reason. But see, that's not sufficient because we humans, our reasoning can be faulty as well. That's why the Bible says there's a way that seems right in the man. The end thereof are the ways of death. We are to be scripturally driven. We are to prepare our minds to respond according to God's command. 1 Peter 1.14 says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Do you remember the story in the Old Testament where Joseph was a slave in Egypt? And Miss Potiphar just tempted him every day to go to bed with him every day she was relentless and joseph was single and in his mid-20s and unmarried and if he if he had reacted emotionally impulsively he would have yielded in fact if he had relied on his reasoning he could have rationalized it in his mind this is to my advantage it's accepted in this culture. She'll be mad at me if I don't. But Joseph responded, I can't do this thing against my God. And he turned and ran. He trained his mind for obedient reaction when temptation comes. Remember when Jesus, after he had fasted for 40 days in the wilderness, Satan came to him tempting him and said, If you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Well, if Jesus had done what his emotions wanted to do, he would have yielded instantly. But he responded. It is written that man doesn't live by bread alone. So to prepare your mind for action means that you program your mind to respond to God's will, even if it's contrary to the emotions you're having or your reasoning. Well, how do you do that? You prepare. The word prepare here is in the tense that conveys the idea of continuing action. You're always preparing. You're always preparing. That's why we read our Bible regularly. David said, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against God. So if you've been a Christian for a while, challenge yourself by taking a deeper study that will force you to dig deeper. I so enjoyed um, Scott Walker and our walk through the, the, the story where he gave us scripture to read every day. And we had about three chapters a day to read and, and, and we learned about the story of Jesus Christ. I, I just love that. And, and so what he calls me to do by reading these chapters every day is he calls me to look into the scripture deeper than I had before. And I just appreciate that so much. First Peter chapter 3 verse 15 says, we ought to be able to give reason for the hope that we have. You know, emotion reacts. This is different and exciting. Reason listens with skepticism. But we need to prepare our minds for action and dismiss that kind of shallow speculation immediately. You know, I love what the Living Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. It encourages us to become full-grown in the Lord. Yes, to the point of being fulfilled with Christ, 
then we will no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us different or has cleverly lied to us and made the lie sound like the truth. Instead, instead, we'll lovingly follow the truth at all times, speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly, and so become more and more in every way like Christ, who is head of the body, his church. But when the mature mind is prepared for obedient action, there's still trust. Remembering that God has promised, in the world you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble. So be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Secondly, to help us deepen morally. Becoming like God in His holiness. Look at verse 15. But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. So what is meant by the word holy? We speak of the Holy Bible. We, we speak of the Holy Land. What does holy mean? Well, it means distinctive, pure, sacred, belonging to God. And we usually think of holy, of holiness negatively in terms of what we don't want to do. A holy person doesn't get drunk. A holy person doesn't do drugs, doesn't use profanity, doesn't commit adultery, doesn't smoke, doesn't lie, doesn't cheat. Admittingly, removing sinful activities is a part of holiness, but the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Now, holiness doesn't just mean the absence of immorality. It doesn't mean we're weird. It doesn't mean that you've got to dress like a Puritan or, or be odd for God. Holiness is much more. Holy, holiness is not just an appropriate amount of sin avoidance. It's a passionate pursuit of God's virtue in this world. Holiness is becoming like God. God is generous. God is impartial. God is faithful. God is merciful. God is love. God is humble. God is pure. God is love. So true holiness is powerfully attractive. You know, it's moral courage and sacrificial love and sheer joy that make people sit up and go, wow. So that's what it's like being a follower of Christ. If they can see that in you and people sit up and go, wow, I want to be a part of that. It's being like Jesus whose goodness drew people to himself like a magnet. And if you have a worldly background, you're probably going to have some profane habits that you brought with you when you started your new life in Christ, and it may take a while to remove them and, and to replace them with God's character. But as we, go, as we grow in Christ, we move from conforming to our own evil desires to conforming to God's character. You know, if a, if a one-year-old child learning to walk falls, you know, we giggle, we pick him back up, we encourage him to do it again. He falls again. He, he'll walk like Frankenstein with his little old arms out here like this, and he'll fall. No harm done. But if a 10-year-old does that, if he repeatedly stumbles, it's a sign that something is seriously wrong. And if you've been a Christian for quite some time, 
It's time to walk in holiness. It's time to start time to start walking in holiness. It's time to quit stumbling. So look at verse 16. Simon Peter gives four motivations for holiness. Four motivations for holiness. The first is a desire to resemble the Heavenly Father. Look at verse 16. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. You know, if a child admires his father, he'll soon be talking and walking and resembling his dad. You know, if we love and worship the Heavenly Father, pretty soon we're going to look like him. Pretty soon we're going to resemble our father as we mature. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says, Be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children. The second motivator is a reverent fear of judgment. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Verse 17. See what it says? Now, you know, if there's surveillance cameras watching us right now, we're, we're prone to behave. You know, if we think somebody's watching us on a... You know, we're just prone to behave. Well... God warns us. God tells us that we're going to have to give account for every action. He tells us we're going to have to give account for every word that we say, everything we've done in secret. There is a motivator to holiness. And sometimes we do the right thing out of love for God, and sometimes we do things out of reverent fear of judgment. The third motivation is a recognition of futility of unholiness. Look at verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life. Underline that if you're one that underlines in your Bible. The empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. Peter calls the ungodly life an empty life. An empty life. You know, have you ever committed something you know was wrong and it just you know, you just were so upset about it because you realize it was so empty. The best example that I can recall of this is the story that's found in the Gospels about the prodigal son. When he came to his senses, he realized the empty life that he had. He experienced an empty stomach, an empty soul in a pig pen, and he came to himself and he says, you know what, this is stupid. I've blown it. I'm not staying here. I'm not going to stay here one more night. I'd be better off as a servant in my father's house, so I'm going home. I can be a slave for him. It's better than what I'm doing now. So how many times have you had to go through that empty feeling before you conclude it's really not worth it? The cost of sin is way out of proportion to the pleasure it produces. And you've just decided, you know, I'm, I'm not going to buy it anymore. The fourth motivator is the loving sacrifice of Jesus. Look at verse 19. You were redeemed. I like that. You were redeemed. Do you, do you remember when the s &H green stamp store used to be down on the square here in Franklin? And, and when you were growing up and you bought groceries, they gave you stamps. And, and you know, your mom and dad would let you take those stamps and lick them and put them in the book. And you saved books and you used those books. And you could go down to the store and redeem those books for something valuable. I still have a catcher's mitt that I got by redeeming stamps at, at the store. Well... It, it means re redeem is paying the price. Peter tells us, you've been redeemed. Somebody's paid the price. You've been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope 
are in God. You see, the cross was not an accident. It was an appointment. And it was not human tragedy. It was divine strategy. And it was part of God's plan before time began. And Christ denied his personal desires and will, willingly sacrificed himself on the cross for us because he loved us. So it's certainly not too much for us to ask us to sacrifice some personal pleasure for the one who sacrificed his all for us. Gratitude is a powerful motivator to holiness. And only Jesus loved you enough to pour out his lifeblood on your behalf. So since he's called you his holy, be holy in all that you do. And thirdly, if we're going to mature socially, we need to by loving one another deeply. Look at verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. Now, we've talked about children this morning. We've talked about babies, and we've talked about toddlers learning to walk. And, and isn't it funny, when your children begin to grow, one of the hardest things we have to teach our children is not to be selfish. It, you know, if they're in a room, and if, and if they're selfish, they everything, you know, it's their world. They want all the toys. They want the best toys. They, they think that the world revolves around them. So they, they have to be taught to, to share and it's not really in their nature to do that yet, but we have to teach them to share. The same is true for us spiritually. One of the most difficult lessons we have as Christians is to put people first. Put people first. Put others ahead of self. Instead, oftentimes we say, well, I want my needs met. I want my music sung. I want my kind of sermon preached. I want to sit in my pew every Sunday. It upsets me when somebody else sits there. I want my time respected. I want my children honored. And if we don't get our way, we have a tendency to throw a temper tantrum. So if we're deepening as Christians, we move from being self-centered to other-centered. We think about others. The Bible says in the book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Now in this verse, Peter uses two different words for love. Philadelphia, which is brotherly love, and agape, which is godlike, sacrificial love. Warren Wiersbe points out, We share brotherly love because we're brothers and sisters in Christ and have likenesses. We share agape love because we belong to God and therefore can look, can overlook each other's differences. So when you become a Christian, you have a network of Christian brothers and sisters all around the world who learn to love one another deeply. That's called the church. And we've all been bought by the same blood. We experience the same birth. We belong to the same Father. We enjoy the same nourishment. So as you mature in the family, that love deepens. And you learn to take advantage of the opportunity to express love because you've recognized that life is fleeting. Look what he wrote in verse 24. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. See, mature Christians realize that life doesn't go on forever. People die, and your chance of influencing them is just really temporary. So we need to take advantage of the opportunity to express our love while they're alive. In order for you to deepen, you must get rid of wrong attitudes that will alienate you from other people. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Here's that word again, therefore. Because, see, everything we've been talking about this morning now, he says, therefore, so it reflects action or an attitude here. Verse 1, chapter 2, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, 
envy and slander of every kind. You know, the natural man harbors malice and seeks to get even. A mature Christian loves enough to forgive and forget. And if you've been a Christian a couple of decades and you're still nurturing hatred and bitterness, not speaking to people, slandering people, it's time to grow up. It's time to stop. You're being childish. You're stunning your growth. So don't harbor anger or envy or resentment. Don't try to get even by deception or slander. Be big enough to forgive as Jesus has forgiven you. Don't go to your grave harboring a grudge. You know who was a good example of someone who deepened in all these three areas? It was Simon Peter, the author of this letter. When he first came to Christ, he was driven by emotion. And then he had a, a personality that he was up and down all the time, confessing Christ one minute and telling him he's wrong the next. He became a man of obedience and consistency, willing to give his own life and being faithful to Christ. But he wasn't a holy man at first. He was egotistical, demanding center stage, known to lose his cool and curse on occasion. But when he grew to be like his heavenly father, he insisted no one pay him homage. He took abuse without retaliating. And when Peter first came to Christ, he wasn't very loving. He was prejudiced toward other people, toward other races. And he even tried to kill a man with a sword. But Peter deepened in love and sensitivity. He entered the home of a Gentile soldier and shared the gospel with him. He stopped at the sight of a blind beggar and said, we'd really like to help you. How can we help you? And he personally demonstrated what it meant to grow deeper in faith. So Simon Peter has the right to encourage us to be like newborn babes who crave spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. That's lesson number two in the book of First Peter. Thank you again for joining us this morning. We do hope that you're able to attend this coming Wednesday evening here at the building. Dr. Joe Beam is bringing the third lesson to us on Seeing the Unseen. That's a book that he has written. He's bringing us lessons centered around that book. Dr. Joe Beam has been bringing us some really good lessons, and we hope that you can come to this building and worship with us on Wednesday evening. At the end of Dr. Beam's lesson on September 30th, we're going to have a singing here on this campus. It's going to be in the back of uh, the yard of where Miss Amy Hargrove lives. We invite you to bring your lawn chairs. Uh, the music sheets will be provided for you. And we hope that you can come the evening of September 30th and join us in that singing. We hope you have a blessed day. In just a few minutes, we look forward to seeing you again in our worship hour. May God bless.